Dr. Robert Kiltz, welcome to the Keto Cam Podcast. Ben, thank you so much. I'm really great to, to, grateful to be here and share the conversations of healing people outside the box of uh, standard uh, practice of medicine and, and healthcare. We're going to talk a lot about that box and why that box is very, very dangerous, and we want to stay away out of that box, so we'll, we'll get to that for sure. I was on your podcast a couple of months ago, your amazing podcast. We had a fantastic conversation. We first connected in New York, New York City at the Keto yeah. Symposium where uh, our mutual friend Christina Hess was hosting a conference and we had dinner and we hit it off. And I, I just love the work that you're doing. And we're going to talk about some really amazing outside the box, as you mentioned, um, challenge, maybe it might challenge your way of thinking. And I encourage the audience to keep, keep an open mind here. And I, I promise you, you're going to get some great valuable nuggets. So before we get there, what's the backstory? How did you even get involved with what you're doing today? Well, I'm a fertility physician. I practice uh, IVF and, and uh, recurrent pregnancy loss and medicine about miscarriages and implantation failure and just all sorts of things related to um, infertility. And I've uh, been doing this now for 30 years. I own and run CNY Fertility Centers. Um, I'm a surgeon, a full-time practicing physician. I practice a lot of reproductive immunology. And um, I call myself also a nutritionist today. And ultimately, none of us are trained in nutrition in, in medical school. But I've been a standard medical uh, physician for years. I uh, went to um, USC, LA City College. I went to UCLA, uh, UC Davis for uh, medical school. And I went into uh, OBGYN because I really loved uh, taking care of um, uh, women who were seeking pregnancy and the challenges of, of being a woman. And I found it uh, very fulfilling. Um, I kind of went into medicine because uh, I had some challenges in my family. My sister suffered from diabetes for years. And uh, I was just, again, compelled to go into medicine and see what I could do to help. Well, in my years of practicing medicine, I found that um, I was still doing just uh, the standard drugs, surgeries, and, uh, and dissections. And that was kind of it in general. There was a lot of success, but there was a lot of failure. And I couldn't figure out the failure, and that kind of challenged me. I found myself getting into a mind and body medicine, uh, meditation, prayer, yoga, acupuncture, and integrating that in my practice 20-plus years ago. And while I was doing that, uh, a number of my patients were getting pregnant on paleo diet. Um, I didn't know what paleo diet was because Mediterranean diet was a healthy thing that most of us should be doing, and I focused on, on that when diet didn't matter. But through paleo diet, I began to read about um, diets in general. I found keto diet, Marie Emmerich, and many others. And uh, then I tripped over carnivore myself uh, about 12 years ago. And I personally suffered from arthritis, psoriasis, kidney stones, migraines, and you know a whole list of diseases that got better on paleo, got better on keto, and then went away on carnivore. So I just, for me personally, that's the, the, the scenario how I got to where I'm at. But I began to share this with my clients because my job as a physician is to find everything I can, whether it's Western medicine or Eastern medicine, things that I can do or things that they can do to help them with the success of building a family. Um, and through that, I my sister died of, of diabetes, Marianne, I mentioned that a moment ago. And I, it was like, okay, what's the cause of disease? And I'm a why person, you know, I got to dig deep into all the why part of all of this. And when I found keto, carnivore, fasting, meditation, prayer, um, and, and changing my whole lifestyle and then sharing the change with my clients, a um, tremendous amount of success began to happen. Well, it's not easy. It's challenging. Not everyone believes it. Most of us in Western medicine don't believe it because it's not standard because the standard philosophy is three to six meals a day, fruits, fiber, vegetables, seeds, and nuts, lean meat, no red meat. And um, there's a genetic reason or it's just we don't know. It's mostly we don't know. And so I'm just thrilled to share the story because I feel like I'm a little kid in a candy store that just found the, the holy grail to the answers to all the universe. Yeah, well, it's an amazing journey you've had, and it's uh, incredible how many years you've been in the game and learning and unlearning and relearning, which is a very, very important, especially these days. I want to talk about your sister. Marianne, was her name? Yes, Marianne. She was diagnosed with uh, 
diabetes when she was four. She ended up passing away when she was 52 from the complications of it. Uh, and it's not just Marianne, you know, that happened with my dad and it's happening to so many people. W would you say that it's actually kind of rare to die from diabetes, but it's the, the generation of it and then the, the disease is connected to diabetes that really kills somebody? Well, yeah, you know, so we call it diabetes, which is sort of our general description for what we think is the cause or just the, the this compilation of disorders, which are all related to a sugar intake or plant intake, which then damages the uh, blood vessels, the nerves, uh, which then d damage the organ systems that require proper nerve function and vascular function. And so in general, I think it's just a poisoning of plant eating and that's as simple as that and some people are more genetically predisposed than others maybe uh, but my sister was exposed to something that took away her production of insulin which is type 1 which is less common than the type 2 diabetes which is which is um, basically secondary to excessive carbohydrate intake uh, where my sister has lost her insulin uh, production for one reason or another. But interesting enough, the cure for that was give insulin mm -hmm. um, and a diabetic diet was um, plants, fruits, and vegetables, which essentially is a sugar diet. And yeah. just it, it's contributing to the worsening of it and too many people are suffering from it today. What are your thoughts on the the, the mastering diabetes docs who promote a plant-based diet for treating type 1 diabetes specifically, um, how are they getting away with teaching that when, when you're making the case, and I'm, I'm on your side here, that it's actually a, you know, a plant issue, a carbohydrate issue. So how are they promoting that and getting away with what they're doing? Well, because the paradigm or the paradox or the propaganda, trying to find the right word that goes with that, is that, um, that uh, fruits and vegetables are natural, uh, healthy foods and they're low in sugar or no in sugar. And, and so if you believe one thing, but truly the opposite is fact, uh, we can't solve it because, and I don't know whether it's a lie, meaning people know it's a lie, but they keep sharing it. Or my sense is, is that because the, the sounding of fruits and vegetables are good for you and they're so important for you is so pervasive at every level. Even smart scientific doctors can't quite figure it out because it's so wrong, this concept of what we're sharing, unfortunately. Yeah. And how can we make the change? And that's what we really need to be doing. And um, uh, that's what this is all about. The more we talk about the where we share it, can we get the research to prove it? Well, the plant-based paradigm of plants are good is so powerful uh, and the money deriv derived by that is so powerful that it's, it seems nearly impossible. But, you know, you can't fight something. You can't fight against something. You can only sponsor for the cure. And that's what this is really all about. Yeah, amen. And you, you had a, a TEDx talk, uh, which is all about this. And uh, I thought it was controversial because it's very different than a regular TEDx talk. It was called um, The Human Ferrari. And you compared the human body to either being a Ferrari or a, a, a Hugo, I think you called, right? The, is that what it's called, the Hugo? The Hugo is the Yugoslavian uh, built um, uh, car, which was designed in Italy. So, you know, it's got the, it's got the Ferrari design, but it was manufactured in the wrong place. So talk, share a little bit about what you shared during that TEDx talk. What is, how do we build a, a human Ferrari? Well, we are actually designed as a temple, a Ferrari and a lion, which are three things that we hold with esteem and respect. And, and so if you compare that to a Yugo um, or a, pig, uh, no disrespect to any of these things, by the way, or an amusement park. And so if you and I actually have the DNA of the things that are the, the most high, but you take care of it like the most low, is it any wonder that we're all diseased and sick and dying younger and younger and younger or requiring massive amounts of health care, dollars and drugs and dissections that don't give us quality of life, but may give us some more longevity 
Um, and so, you know, I, I kind of played around with this for a while because, you know, I always like to equate something to something else, right? And so who's the most valuable, irreplaceable entity of the universe? Well, you are. But why would you take care of yourself like you're not? And so we're sharing ideas that are opposite of what we've been taught, right? So, you know, even alcohol, it's okay. A glass of wine, two glasses of wine, and even the American Journal of OBGYN, the American College of OBGYN recommends red wine to a pregnant woman. Really? Which is disturbing to me. Wow. Again, recent article last year, uh, a an expert review that a Mediterranean diet, a plant-based diet is good for you, and they even included red wine. So we know a pregnant woman or, or, or a, um, a lactating woman who's breastfeeding their child should not drink alcohol at all. And so, you know, again, you can you can understand that you admire a Ferrari, a temple, and and a lion because the lions are the symbol of strength, and so we are like a lion. We're we're um, we're regal and strong, and lions eat like a carnivore. They eat less frequently, and. They don't line up in line and uh, with an addiction to a plant product, tea, coffee, alcohol, pizza, pasta, bread, and um, that's as simple as that. And pizza, I think I mentioned that. But it, it is because we need symbols, we need something to equate it to because if you go to the amusement park every day, your body's going to be trashed. And that's not good for us. Now, we've taken an amusement park and made it every day Instead of recognizing we are a temple holy in its in its production, its its entity, right? But we've taken holy and taken made it every day a holiday instead of recognizing that holidays are meant to be time to time. So you can go to the amusement park from time to time. But if you go all the time, you know what it's going to do to your body. And that's and that's sort of really what my intention was, is sort of you can say, well, you know, every time I go to the amusement park, I come back with a stomach ache or a headache the next day. Or I'm like, gee, why did I do that? And and so in, in a Yugo, again, DNA of the masters, but it took equipment, supplies, uh, uh, materials uh, with poor workmanship uh, in a place where the cars just didn't last very long, and so yet it was it was designed by Fiat, so which is a which is a quality car made in Italy, but I say the Ferrari is the one. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that. So it's a it's a perfect analogy. So when we see the average American, they are consuming three hundred to four hundred grams per day, probably not from fruits and vegetables, but let's say they're also throwing in some fruits and vegetables. But a lot of it's processed and seed oils, etc. And to your point that you've made in the past, um, there's no such thing as an essential carbohydrate, yet that's the majority of what we eat. So in comparison, it's like we're going to the amusement park every single day, multiple times a day, and that's part of the reason why people just are so unhealthy and feel like crap. Is that what you're saying? Hey, I wanna just briefly interrupt the video you're watching to share something with you. One of my favorite companies that I use for health and longevity and biohacking is a company called Bond Charge. And they have a whole range of incredible products, including the blue light blocking glasses you see me wear right now. But one of my favorite products from them is an infrared sauna blanket. That's right. Uh, you don't have to spend a ton of money investing in a sauna or spending so much time driving to a facility with the sauna. They actually created a sauna blanket that you could use in the comfort of your own home. And I use this all the time. Why would we want to even do a sauna? Well, there's a lot of research and a lot of studies showing the benefits of infrared sauna. The sauna blanket works by raising your heart rate to a workout or a training session. So you burn more calories while you're actually lying down and relaxing. You could burn up to 600 calories in one single session. Also, it's gonna cause you to sweat. And one method of flushing out toxins from your body is through sweat. There's also one of my favorite benefits, this endorphin release, endorphin rush you get from using a sauna blanket. And I, every time I get out of the sauna blanket, I feel like I just got a 60 minute 
massage. And uh, that's because of the endorphin benefit from it. So how this works differently than a regular sauna is that it works by using infrared light, which heats the body directly rather than the air around you like a traditional sauna. This means you get the same benefit at a lower heat. So it's easy to set up. It's super convenient. 30 to 40 minutes uh, will suffice in terms of the length of the sessions. And you do that two to three times a week, you're going to feel amazing. Add that to your keto fasting protocol and watch what it does for your results. You could do it while you watch TV. You could do it while you read a book. I do it while I listen to an audio book. So if you want to learn more about the Bond Charge products, including the sauna blanket, head over to bondcharge.com slash keto camp. And if you use the coupon code keto camp at checkout, you'll get 15% off your sauna blanket. And actually any of their products are 15% off with that code. Bond Charge hooked you up. So head over to that domain or click the link down below and go get your Bond Charge products. All right, let's get back to today's video. Yeah, essentially, you know, so we 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 get up and we have uh, we have cereals, which are essentially sugars, um, and they're told they're healthy. And and you know, on our way to work, we stop at the donut place or the buck place or wherever it is, and we're grabbing you know a smoothie, a shake, and we're grabbing a smoothie and a shake, and um, we're we're really forgetting how critically important and valuable each of us are, and. You know, fruits and vegetables in and of themselves are not bad for you. And and not even a little bit of sugar and cereals, it's not bad for you, except you consume it all the time. Mm. If you had that treat once in a while, you'd be okay. But the fact that you're having it three to six times a day, like you're a, an herbivore, but you're more like a carnivore in your style, eat less frequently, uh, rest more, slow it down, and and uh, think like the regal would think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. So let's talk about fat. We know just basic human physiology, the cell membrane, which is really the key to a healthy human body, a Ferrari. Cell membrane is critical to have a, a beautiful, nice, healthy membrane that's with healthy integral membrane proteins and receptor sites hearing the communication from our nutrients and hormones and oxygen. and. If you just ask the question, if anybody asks the question, okay, if the membrane is that important, what is the membrane made of? What supports the membrane? Well, it's 80% fat and then protein, right? And it's the saturated fat and the cholesterol that doctors say it's bad for you. Are you, are you having trouble with your mic? No, no, no. I'm listening. Oh. I'm li I'm, I apologize. I, I, you know, I'm listening. I'm Italian, <laughs> and I'm, I'm, you know, I, my arms want to go like this. I, I want to move. Like, and, I'm not... No, no, no. And, 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 sorry. I have a tendency to talk into someone's talking. So, the way I sort of do that is my ADHD no and worries. my dyslexia and my, my. So uh, please, no I'm yeah. listening. Uh, so the mem the membrane is critical. So if that's the case, why are we vil why have others and so many people even to this day villainizing saturated fat and cholesterol to be so inflammatory, leading to heart disease? I mean, how does how does this propaganda how does it stay around for this long? I don't get it. Well, again, propaganda holds strong if you're taught something since you were born uh your brain will hold on to it as true and so we've been trained this way hundreds if not thousands of years actually that that uh, plants are good the fat is bad um the sugar is is good and uh the fat is bad and and we've and the animal fat which is saturated fat is really bad for you but plant oils are good because they're polyunsaturated and they lower from cholesterol. a plant. Right on. So lower cholesterol will make you healthy. So, But the story was the lie because the strength of Ansel Keys was far stronger than the, than, um, oh man, I can't, John, John uh, uh, I'm just going to come to you, but I apologize. But the other at the sugar side, yeah. the sugar side was that sugar's bad, Fat's bad. The the fat's bad. People won. The sugar uh, people lost. And so that's the marketing story, pro propagated by those five percenters that control the marketplace, the and the story that to you and I, the money is made on the market of selling sugars essentially, 
and and you got to be careful because a sugar there are there are actually thousands of sugars, um, and we think glucose and fructose are the really it's and we think sugars are the bad thing. Um, it it really isn't as bad as you think. It's the frequency and the amounts that we consume. But the interesting part is is that the plants are actually much of the toxic side because that's where we get the antigens, the lectins, the phytates, the oxalates, where they cause the immune reaction. Interesting enough, sugar, just white sugar in and of itself, is a glycator. It causes damage to the glycocalyx. It's like rust, okay? And so a little bit of sugar, your body's able to handle it, but a little bit of a peanut, if you are allergic to it, can kill you fast. But white sugar in and of itself, in a small amount, is not antigenic of any significance. It's the whole, the whole uh, uh, glycolipoproteins, the lectins, which are carbohydrate or glycan binding proteins, which are critical for us. But what's interesting is every organism has its unique glycome, its leak, its unique sugars, and its unique lectins. And so plants, bacteria, yeast, viruses, and all other animals have their unique barcode that's determined by their glycans, which are sugars, and glucose is just another glycan. And human beings have about nine important glycans or sugars, monosaccharides, that create this fingerprint, this barcode, so that if you're exposed to these barcodes that are foreign, COVID virus, the, 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 the spike protein, you've heard of those, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. But it's the spike glycoprotein that's the killer because it's the sugars that are the most antigenic, not the proteins which is very interesting. But essentially, and I hope I'm answering this question, I'm kind of going off a little bit because, but ultimately, fat was demonized. Sugar is the bank robber, but it converted itself to fat. Mm. So fat got the blame. Because you don't, you don't build yourself fat at the sugar stores, you build yourself fat stores. So intuitively, it sort of makes sense. And then because you're overweight, obese, fat, and you're sicker than most lean people, we think, not true, we then, once again, fat gets to blame. But if you can step back and look at it and recognize that obesity is not the cause of disease, sugar is. And that sugar to your point, comes from cereals, grains. It's foods that are actually turned into sugar when you eat them. A lot of people think, I don't have sugar, Ben. I, I, you know, I just have my oatmeal or my cereal, but they don't understand that that's turning into sugar. So, so, so here's the crazy story. All plants are made of carbon dioxide. That's a long chain carbon particle that is a sugar. All plants. It doesn't matter what plant it is. Yep. Kale, Brussels sprouts, asparagus, carrots, sugar. Avocados, sugar, mostly. Okay? So you, if you realize that your body, like once the sugar is broken down, it gets into the hepatic portal bloodstream and goes to the liver, your body doesn't know the difference between um, kale, asparagus, broccoli, cane sugar, beet sugar, or honey. No difference. And so you can eat some sugar, that's why keto is perfect because if you're trying to get yourself into ketosis, you can, you can do it. Now, it may not be perfect for everyone like myself. It took me going carnivore to rid myself of everything. But, but, but I must admit, I do have some plants from time to time. It doesn't bother me most of the time because I know as long as I eat less frequently, I focus on the higher amounts of fat, I will minimize my inflammation. How frequently do you have plants? Mm, a few times a week. Um, I may I may have, um, um, oh, let's see, well, let's see, maybe not even that long. I have my French fries maybe twice a month, four times a month. 
but they're they're fried in duck grease, no skin. They're dipped in sour cream with a lot of salt. So again, interesting enough. So fat goes to the liver, goes to the lymphatics and sugars. Again, your body doesn't know which where it comes from. Goes to the goes to the liver. But and then let's see. I have a martini maybe once a month, but it's extra filthy dirty. Mm-hmm. But I minimize it. I really have less and less and less. I almost I never drink at home. I drink a, a sip when I go with my friends once in a while. Um, I'm mostly water now, sparkling water, um, bacon, eggs, butter, beef, my ice cream. I got to throw that yeah. in. There. So I put a little bit of white sugar in my I ice tried. cream. It's delicious. Uh, it, it's amazing. But again, if you're a ketarian keto. And you're having some plants, again, the ones you're, you're least, you're, you have the least um, um, inflammation from, then it's no different if you have white sugar in ice cream or you have a potato or you have kale or asparagus or something like that. The, the science and the physiology of the human body is really remarkable, and that's what I focus on. So plants, are they go to the liver. Fats go to the lymphatic system. Let me ask you this. <clears throat> My book, Keto Flex, is all about ketosis, and I love keto. I love fasting. I know you're a big fan of OMAD and fasting too. But my message is a little bit different than most keto people mm-hmm. out there. I think I shared it when you interviewed me as well. I'm, I'm a big believer in cyclical ketosis, going in and out. Now, somebody who's really overweight and obese, we, I, wanna, I want them to stay in ketosis a little bit longer. But once we've built up that metabolism and got rid of those conditions, I'm a big believer in cycling in some healthy carbohydrates, even some plants if you could tolerate them. I, I, I'm not a fan of long-term sustained ketosis uh, personally. So the question for you is, uh, what are your thoughts on long-term Man. ketosis? Do you think it's sustainable? Do you think it's perfectly healthy? Or do you think it's important to cycle in and out time to time? I don't think we know that answer. Historically, we probably went days in some cases, weeks without food for the first three and a half million years or whatever that number is. I don't know what it is. Um, I think the drive to eat is so powerful and the availability is so powerful. We can tell ourselves anything because it's just easier to give a reason for it. Okay. So now then each of us has our, as our exposures that make us maybe, and I use the word addiction and, and I use it because our withdrawal symptoms, or I've got to have it, or I feel better in this, may be related to a little bit of an addiction. I'm not, it's not a negative thing necessarily. I do agree with you. You don't have to be in ketosis all the time. I don't measure ketosis anyway. Uh, I just know how I feel. I like to do one meal a day in general. I feel pretty good that way. Um, I will sometimes have a little bit of um, a piece of steak in the morning or some butter. I will sometimes also have some dark chocolate. I enjoy it. Um, I, okay, I even have a piece of Wegmans um, dark chocolate cake wow. from time to time. <laughs> and again, be, this is the amazing part because your body does not know the difference between cake, cookie, and kale when it comes to glucose. If you have a little bit from time to time, it's okay. So, and, and again, I think, listen, I find for me what I, it works for me. You find for you. And this is, I, I, vegan, vegetarians, Mediterraneans, pescatarians, and carnivorians are all welcome into this environment. We are all unique and different in our approach to our lives. If you're sick and you're now working to try to solve something, I might say to you, listen, the ultimate elimination is steak, salt, and water. Yeah. And, and that's where I'm going to put you. Um, now, some people can't tolerate beef, but they can tolerate chicken or they can tolerate lamb. That has to do with the fingerprints of the glycobiome that causes inflammation from one thing over another. And why you or I are more sensitive to it, to it it's either exposure or it's genetic predisposition or both. I don't know that we really know that answer. You know, what I love about you, Robert, is that you are, it's easy to have a conversation with you. You're not dogmatic at all. You're open. You're, you're always open to kind of changing your mind about things. And, and you believe that everybody's different and somebody could thrive with a little bit more plants or somebody might need to eliminate them. So I love that openness about you. There is a very non-dogmatic approach to what you teach. I respect that. 
with what you said about some people could have meat, others need chicken or maybe bison or something else because it could create an uh, inflammatory uh, response. What are, what are some of those symptoms that maybe the audience listening or watching should pay attention to without actually like testing and doing blood work? What are some of those symptoms that we might pay attention to that maybe the kale or the whatever it is, the broccoli is actually causing some problems in the body? So nothing is the leading symptom of everything, which is kind of interesting to understand because the leading sign symptom of heart disease is sudden death or it's one of the leadings and the same goes with cancer many other things but in general irritability um sleep disorders um depression anxiety mm -hmm. um, hearing problems sight problems um, i had migraines and bowel problems for years mm -hmm. and you know it was just oh you know here's your your aspirin or or your Metamucil or Tums or whatever it is. And so just think of the most common symptoms, you know, diseases that everyone suffers from, eczema, psoriasis, arthritis, um, dyslexia. I had all those things and that's it. Teeth decay, gum bleeding. I talked to Kevin Stock about this and you know, it's, it's literally the, the, leading, the leading disease, the most common disease is still tooth decay. And, and because we're feeding the microbes in the mouth, which love to destroy your glyco, glycobiome, the glycocalyx. Um, you know, those are all the things that I had. I had hemorrhoids. I, um, I had kidney stones, bowel bleeding. You know, through the years. But my, as a child, it was it was uh, ADHD, OCD, dyslexia, migraines, and stomach aches. Think about all those kids that are being diagnosed with what you just said, and it's a new, primarily can be a nutrition change that fixes all of that. It's insane. Well, well, that's listen again. As a physician, drugs, dissections, and 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 pills. That's the sort of the leading, and that's what I I went into internal medicine first. But I was like, I'm just writing prescriptions for diseases. I have no idea how to do anything other than that. Yeah. I went to OBGYN because I could deliver a baby, I could cut something out. It seemed like I was making some headway. But then when I really got into it and realized that the same problems we gave we gave. Uh, uh, pain medication, uh, uh, weak opiates all the time, and pain was so common, birth control pills for menstrual disorders and endometriosis, and, and ultimately, the nutrition that we've been sharing in this world is deadly for humans. Yeah. And the problem is, the, the, we don't know what's gonna kill you when. And, and really, even carnivore, let's just say, oh, we carnivores are going to live longer. We don't know that. That's true. You know, we're all going to die. You know, am I going to get an extra six months or, or an extra five years? Or am I going to be killed by a vegetarian? I don't know. <laughs> and again, we've got to have fun with all this. And we respect everyone in this process. Yeah. Again, I am not killing anyone to do my diet. I happen to focus mostly on carnivore. But I, you've got to find what feels right for you philosophically, spiritually, or ethically. That's what this is. But my best friend in medical school, Dave Kilmer, died of cancer at age 52. He called me up. I've got lymphoma. Three months later, he was dead. He was always a gracious, amazing, positive human being, top of everything. He was the kid that was like, he was he got along with everyone, fun guy, but he aced everything exam, and he just never studied. But he was just a down-to-earth guy like you, by the way. You remind me of my friend Dave in so many positive ways. And and um, the search of why I believe a standard American diet, excessive exercise, and I think alcohol. Now, he's never a heavy alcohol drinker, but again, we use these things commonly. But the problem is we don't really know that what I'm telling you is going to help you live longer. But Maybe it's going to help you live better because you're not going to need the doctors or the drugs or the dissections quite as much as you might if you if you did something different. Your friend, did you did you know him since you were uh, a kid? No, actually, I met Dave in medical school at UC Davis, oh, wow. and and we just you know we hit it off, and and he loved to run. I hated to run, but we'd go running, and like he'd be like. Whew, and I'd be like, oh, why am I doing <laughs> Slow this? Down, but, dude. but I want to, I want to, I want to do it because my best friend does it. But we used to, we used to, um, 
play uh, you know, football and, and uh, just hang out and have a great time. Medical school for me was like the most fun in my life. And, uh, and it was hard, but you know, it was challenging, but yeah, you see Sarah Holberg, um, yeah. uh, died of, of cancer and, and so the question is, well, why? And watched her amazing conversation with Peter Atia. Amazing, right? And it was such a heartfelt thing. I cried through it. And, but, but the why part of it to me is still likely there's some plant antigens, lectins, oxalates, phytates, or excessive glycation from sugars, or the chemicals that, that for some people are more harmful than others. But again, our ability to predict that per, you know, uh, completely is just not so good. Yeah, I wanna get into the environmental component in a minute. Back to the what to pay attention to in terms of symptoms from plants, at least for myself personally. I have found over the years that I do not do well with anything that has almonds or almond flour. Um, and that's in a lot of keto products. So I always tell my students, it's like, it's probably a good idea to avoid almonds. They're higher in oxalates. There are some better options out there. But for me, every time I consumed almonds, whether it was like almond flour or just straight up almonds, I would get like joint pain, uh, post nasal drip. But I used to get styes, um, very common. I used to think my styes were from like my pets. Like I maybe didn't, like I touched them and I touched my eye and I infected it. But I realized they kept reoccurring and I realized it was not my pets. It was the almond flowers. And I remember one time I was, and it was the oxalates way of trying to get out of my body. But I remember once I was, um, cause I do carnivore 30, 40 days strict, you know, a few times per year. But I remember one time last year I was like, okay, I'm doing carnivore starting tomorrow for 40 days. I'm going to have a whole bunch of these gluten-free Capello's pizza that have a whole bunch of almond flour. I ate three of them and I immediately felt like I was getting yeah. a sty right after I ate it. And the next two days later, big, huge sty started to form and I had it for like 14 days. So I think it was because of the oxalates. Do you think that was uh, the case as well? Partially. Okay. But not significantly. Oh, really? So what do you think it is? It's the plant glycans. It's the glycans. It's, it's, see, this is, the, this is the part that people don't understand. COVID virus killed a lot of people. But so does influenza and hepatitis virus. And, and bacteria, yeast, and viruses are the leading killers. They all contain their unique and individual glyco, glycans. That fingerprint, it touches off the fastest reaction that you and I don't even understand. Sugars are the most antigenic. Okay? So your red blood cells have a glycans that determine if it's A, B, or A, B, or O. Okay, so now if, if you're A and I give you B blood as a transfusion, you will have a reaction. Mm. It's the sugars that are foreign, less so the proteins. Okay? Got it. So, it is, so the anaphylactic reactions are still likely due to a sugar molecule that are unique and different and and not that you i don't know if you could see this yeah, a did. little bit but but um the but explain it for those the, listening well well uh, each of us has a barcode and the glycans are the sugars so you can see that there are insect uh, insect um glycans there are there are yeast glycans there are non-human markers barcodes then there are plant glycans and there are human glycans. And if you see this, these are sialic acid. These are the most common in humans. They're less common in non-human uh, mammals, but they're absent in bacteria, yeast, viruses, and plants. Okay, so, so you're, you're consuming a foreign molecule. And if you, you mentioned the environment. Okay, so we breathe, drink, and eat the environment. Would you agree? Yes. We, we bathe in the environment. We are expose our bodies to the environment. Uh, my partner T and I were on a walk in the beach in Sarasota a few months ago, and she started coughing. And I was like, are you okay? And she said, is there, is there an algae bloom or put the red tide? And I said, doesn't look like it, people in the, in the water. She went on to the app, bingo, there's a bloom. 
it, she's so sensitive to that, but I'm not. Now, I get a bite from those no see Okay, I walk out for one second, I come back in the house, and like I got 50 bites. It's redness everywhere. She never, they never bite her, okay? So we all are susceptible to different antigens and different glycans. So, so ultimately, the almonds contain a certain glycan, peanuts a different glycan, because every organism, it's like why, why humans and apes can't reproduce together, right? The sperm and egg glycans are different. The embryo glycans are different. The uterine environment, its glycans are different. That is the key. This is the magic barcode that why, you know, some people tolerate almonds. I tolerate them a little bit better, uh, but, but I stopped eating all those things of any significance or frequency because I realized if I did. But if you had a peanut allergy, like similar, but, but you probably you didn't have an anaphylactic reaction, but we don't know if it's going to happen one day. That's the problem right now. Less so. But people who have an anaphylactic reaction to peanuts, obviously, you can't even get near them. You can't even kiss someone that you might have eaten or eaten a peanut butter, right? The risk of passing that one molecule of peanut could kill them. A bee sting, same thing, right? Some people are more allergic than others. So that's why that's why there's not a straightforward answer to any of this because our, our genetic predispositions are slightly, are different enough that we're able to tolerate things more frequently. My sister might have gotten type 1 diabetes damage to her islet cells because she happened to have an allergy that caused the damage. Remember, think of all diseases as allergies. Cancer is an allergy. Crohn's is an allergy. Migraine's an allergy, Right? Your, your, your sty is an allergy. Your body's reacting to a foreign particle that you breathed, drank, or ate, or somehow it got through your skin. It will either get you right where it enters or it will just go wherever it wants. Remember, it's dust in the wind. It's going to be impaled in every organ of your body and every cell of your body. For some of those particles, they cause a rapid immunologic response, and for others, it's just a chronic, slow, and sort of mostly benign. Interesting. Okay. So is there any way, any testing we can do to see which barcodes we do better with and which barcodes we should stay away from? Hey, I want to take a minute to share something with you as we take a break from the video you're watching. You know, one of the most common things I see to why people don't have enough energy levels, they have trouble building lean muscle mass, they have brain fog, fatigue, and they don't feel good is because of a deficiency in a hormone called testosterone. Now, testosterone is a very important hormone to have in a healthy amount for both men and for women. So how do you reclaim your vitality? How do you reclaim this very important fat burning and muscle building hormone? Well, you can do it with a powerful supplement called Upgraded T. It has been my go-to for naturally elevating testosterone levels. Upgraded tea is from Upgraded Formulas, and it contains the highest quality of ingredients that have been proven scientifically to increase testosterone production. Now, as I mentioned, if you're a woman watching this, this is very important for you just as a man watching this right now. Upgraded tea is a natural and safe way to boost testosterone levels. When you boost testosterone levels, it's going to increase your sex drive, vitality. It could help replace fatigue with all-day energy. It'll help you lose that stubborn belly fat. Uh, testosterone is required for fat burning, so it'll help you with the last 5 to 10 pounds that you're looking to lose. It helps you be in a better mood, helps with your memory and focus. So here's the three-step approach. Step one, take two capsules of upgraded tea with water every morning. It does not break your fast. You can have it with food or without food. Step number two, notice your energy levels and dominate your day with more confidence and more vitality. Step number three, Wake up the next day having better sleep and just keep doing what you're doing. As simple as that. So if you want to get your hands on upgraded formulas, upgraded tea, and any of their awesome products like their upgraded magnesium and their hair mineral analysis testing kit, head over to upgradedformulas.com. And if you use the coupon code ketosis at checkout, they're going to give you 15% off your entire order. That is upgradedformulas.com. Ketosis at checkout. We're going to drop that link down below. And let's get back to today's video. 
Well, you can do some skin testing and maybe some blood testing, um, but but if you have any of the symptoms of any diseases, this something you're breathing, eating, or or drinking, or getting in you in some way or another that's getting in there. But you know, you, 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 mom, moms will say, you know, they always drink milk or cheese, and you know, they they get these puffy eyes and these phlegm and coughs. My daughter, my we never, I didn't know this. My daughter is now thirty four, so long ago, and uh, my wife at the time, I either didn't make milk or didn't want to breastfeed, uh, and and uh, so we used Enfamil. And as a OB/GYN resident, they gave it to us for free. Okay, so my daughter was just Enfamil. Now she had projectile vomitus as a little child for years okay but did we ever think allergy mm. no not really right and so it was soy based and all these yeah. things now she went on to princeton nyu and Wharton business school so wow. she's quite intelligent so now i'm not going to say that that made it that way i'd like to think maybe mom and dad had something <laughs> to do sure. with that <laughs> but probably not um but but i i think that there are some things but it sometimes takes talking to someone a coach like yourself or, or or other people in the 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 space of coaching and nutritional um, um, area of, of of science that can help you understand. Well, let's look at your 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 food uh, list. Okay, a daily journal of what you eat. You must do it in one way or another. I don't care if it's an app, a picture, or write it down. Because if I ask people what they ate, it's usually clean, healthy, um, organic. And uh, balanced, yeah, right? right? I said, no, no, no. What do you, or keto, paleo, they don't say carnivore very often, yeah. <laughs> but more and more they are with me. But but it's, it is, write it down because because quite commonly we don't know, we don't, we forget, right? I get three things. I'm saying you eat three things and that's it. Well, then I ask, well, do you eat, do you eat fruit, fiber, vegetables, seeds? And I say, yeah, I eat all those things. I say, okay, we'll write those down. So it's really critical. It's just a food journal. Symptoms you're having, um, you can get some skin tests. There are some blood tests that are a little bit more than I than I understand because that's not my area of expertise. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, uh, I want to transition into fertility, which you're obviously an expert on. You've got uh, a couple books on it as well. well. A book on keto, a book on uh, fertility called The Fertile Feast. Uh, so go get that book. We'll we'll link it down below. Um, and the role of environmental toxins on what we're seeing with uh, fertility issues and just um, inflammation. So I know you know these studies. The Environmental Working Group examined the cord blood of newborns, and they found that they began life exposed to 287 of the 413 toxic chemicals in the study, and 180 of them were found to cause cancer. And according to the Columbia University School of Public Health, 95% of cancer is caused by diet and environment. So what is going on with our environment and uh, children being born, babies being born, uh, having a, just this chance of like fighting for their life? Once we were hunters and occasionally gatherers, I bet, and we then began to make fire, which began the, the exposure of smoke, and maybe we smoked some of the things we before we ate them, um, but in our modern world, you know, the, the toxins in the air come from every industrial plant you can imagine, our cars, our, our coal plants, uh, and, and, and every product we consume, uh, just read the labels. They have things that I can't even pronounce. And so it's getting everywhere. And, and there are neurotoxins, endocrine disruptors, um, there are metabolic disruptors, um, they can kill you fast or they can damage your egg or your sperm in your great, great grandmother and grandfather, which those damages can be passed on to you generations later. So the real exposure begins when, b before you're even born, before you even created in utero. Think about that, right? The, the sperm exposed, the egg exposed and mom and dad, and now now your embryo is exposed because mom, whether she's drinking, smoking, uh, what she's eating, uh, what 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 things she's putting on, um, I can't remember the name of the soap, but really fancy, expensive soap that we've been using for a few years, it was just recalled for bacteria and bugs inside it. And then, you know, it's like I said, well, I, I don't even use anything in the shower anymore. I just jump in, cold water, no soap, 
best I've ever done. And, and, but yeah, it is. And again, the majority of the, the chemicals come from plants actually. Mm. Okay. Because plants are, they make pesticides in order to control the bacteria, yeast and viruses because bacteria yeast, and viruses love plants. And you think about the microbes that are everywhere, but then the initial chemicals like like uh, nicotine and caffeine come from plants we use those by the way as pesticides for our agriculture by the way and then we began to practice you know changing them and adjusting them and making all these synthetic chemicals so they're using uh, nicotine and caffeine as pesticides in plants is that what you just said uh, Oh, absolutely. So you would soak you would soak um, tobacco leaves in water, spray it on the plants to kill the bugs, mm. right? And so, I mean, caffeine uh, and 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 ca- coffee beans have toxic chemicals in them, right? There's there's toxins in everything, by the way. Even a piece of ribeye steak likely has a minute amount of toxins, because anything you eat has something in it yeah. that may be harmful, but the, but it's 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 now the amount, right? Yeah. Is heroin f- good for us, right? You know, luckily maybe some people survive it, but it's not something good we want. But every plant, every organism, every bacteria, yeast, and virus, every every tick, all these things have something. If you think about cereals, right, the grains, the grains, the granaries are allowed to have a certain amount of bacteria, yeast, and viruses or, you know, or rat poop in it. Uh, it's you know the zero is never the answer because nothing is zero. Right. So they're going to say, well, there was only this amount of parts per million, but once someone gets sick from it, you're going to ask the question, well, maybe our parts per million should be zero, mm-hmm. and maybe this allowable amount that the government gives or industry allows is 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 not good. And so that's why it's so important to be really careful to know what you're consuming, what you're bathing in, what you're breathing. You know, nowadays people bring me nice candles to light, right? But they're all scented or the soaps are scented or the whatever you're putting on or makeup, whatever, even, okay, I use a little bit of hair gel, all right? It's made from sugar. Interesting. Okay. You know that sugar gets, gets, get, you know, it's hardens, yeah, right? Yeah. That the hardening of our arteries, by the way, it's caused by sugar, Correct, yeah. not by fat. So interesting. Okay. Um, yeah. W- there was a study that came out from the um, University of Newcastle, which showed that the average person consumes around 2,000 tiny pieces of plastic each week, or about five grams, which equates to the weight of the average credit card. It, it, you know, it, it it's such an interesting thing because the, so microplastics okay and and we don't even know where they're at but fish to me have the majority of the microplastics now maybe we're breathing some of them because dust you see the environment dust is is made from mostly plants pollen most antigenic by the way and and that's why even when you eat plants, that's why when I stopped plants and suddenly I, I wasn't using my hay fever medicine, which I've been taking for years. I had it in my bag for two years. I opened it up one day and said, I haven't touched that in two years. Wow. But, but yeah, the pl- microplastics, you know, we piss and poop in the waters ways of the world. It goes into the oceans and the other waters and the animals that we eat from there consume it. Now, it, maybe you can't get away from it completely. And so you, you you do the very best you can, depending on where you're living, your culture, your resources. I mean, obviously, what we're trying to do is say, what's the top of the line? You know, uh, uh, you're going to find something that works right for you and your family in this. But you want to do your very best to be at the top because that's critical. But, you know, I try my best to um, eat out of a kilt, drink out of a kilt's cup, you know, do my ceramics. Although, okay, here someone bought me oh. some Gerolsteiner out of plastic. I they even have those in plastic. I've only seen them in glass. I, I, you know, they, they delivered it. And I was like, okay, what do I do with that? Well, usually what I do is I then pour it into my my glass bottle or my, my, my metal bottle that I carry. But, but you know, we have to be very cognizant. What do we do with these things? So you recycle them properly and hopefully our recycling methods are managing them in the way that they're not just spewing them into the universe. But the problem is, is the oceans of the world, the waterways are just spewing with these nanoparticles. 
and and uh, the plastics are are everywhere, and I don't know what how many lifetimes it's going to take. But eventually, humanity may be gone. Maybe the manufacturing of all the fake things that we create are going to be gone, and the and the plants who already control the world are going to take it back yeah. and say enough is enough. We tried you guys for a while, but they're already, I don't they're know, already maybe doing s- that at. Uh... Chernobyl. They're already thriving. The bacteria. Well, well, that. So the plants. See, this is the interesting part, and that's why when you see, when you eat a plant, it has DNA. It's no different than a virus, yeast, or bacteria. It, in one way, wants to own you. And so, you know, heroin, cocaine, marijuana, cyanide, nicotine, all the addictive things come from plants. And Georgia Eat, I don't know if you've had the pleasure of having her on your show yet, but and I haven't either, but she's amazing. Uh, Andres Ianfeld from dietdoctor.com, I learned from, I don't know, 15 years ago. And I emulate, but then I moved on. But Georgia Eat, basically a, a... She's healing all the the mental disorders by going to a mostly meat diet. But I love her because she's very scientific. Well, we haven't proven this. The science doesn't say this. And here's what I can tell you. I think rather than I'm right and, you know, that that part of it. But but um, um, we we need to clean up the world. And that's what this is really all about. Do the very best you can in this world to take care of you and your family. But remember this, all of humanity is our family. We are all the same. We're unique in our, in our, in our outward expressions of life. And maybe there's some genetic predispositions slightly, but 99% we're more like lions than anything else. And lions are regal, and they're, and and they know how to care for their 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 family. Mm-hmm. I have a, a couple of a specific fertility questions. So, yo, please. My best friend, his name is Ronald, and his wife Carla are having their second baby due in June. And she texted me yesterday asking, "What do I think about her eating her own placenta?" Well, likely we did it because you wouldn't want to waste any potential resource for energy and and ultimately if you go back to the glycobiome your placenta is more you than anything else you eat and so you have created this master meal with uh, blood and uh, fat and protein uh, and sugars there's stem cells in there too and stem cells of course there are there 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 are placental stem cells which are are uh, anti-inflammatory you know i don't know that i understand completely what it fixes in the sense of well i'm going to give it to you for your diseases but there's a little information we do some stem cell prp mm. in our work in infertility because we think it really helps um and and the answer is yes how should you prepare it i don't know that answer like sous vide or or Cap- raw or maybe Dry age or capsulated. Yeah. Well, pr- people are probably are they doing it already? Probably. Yeah. Right. Um, but I think, I think we we're too we're too sort of turned off by things that we should be like, wow, this is amazing and good for us. You know, fatty liver or blood. You know, we should eat the bloody liver. See, we we historically likely ate the blood, the organ meats, right? You got it. You didn't like drain it out and then eat they it. They value right? that the most. It was critical. And so iron, why do we have a lack of iron? Well, even if you're eating lean meat, you're not eating the fatty meat nor the blood. That's where it's at. So the spleen, the liver, the lions cut the organism open, eat the organ meats, um, and that's number one. And the uh, the fat, the fat that the that surrounds the kidney and the organs is so critical. We infuse fat, and I recommend a stick of butter or fat every day to reduce bowel inflammation first, and then it'll go to vascular inflammation. Remember, the vessels support and provide the fat which is suppressive, suppresses microbes. And so uh, if you think about it, have you ever noticed that butter never molds? Yeah. Makes sense. Because, it's because, because fat and obesity is not the cause of disease. Mm-hmm. The toxic bucket is everywhere because it comes from the bowels of what you ate in the day, in the week, in the month. But it's not fat. 
Well, Dr. Kilch just gave everybody the approval to eat a stick of butter every day. Doctor every day. Right there. <laughs> One more question on fertility. Yeah. Take uh, your time. Male with high levels of follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone, uh, chronically high for years and years and years. What would be the cause of that? I, I was thinking a pituitary adenoma, but there was no symptoms for that. What would be some other causes for that? Well, there could be a pituitary adenoma, um, and you want to you want to get an MRI or a CT of the brain to just check because sometimes there are some adenomas, but usually it's the opposite. It suppresses LH and FSH. Yeah, right. And Where then you adenoma, become it's usually lower, right? Yeah, right, right, right. right. Uh, okay, but but if I get so so the the high LH and FSH is 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 usually related to testosterone depletion or estrogen depletion. So your end organs aren't making estrogen or testosterone. So the brain says, hey, there's no estrogen because it's a positive and negative feedback system. Right. So if there's no estrogen or testosterone, your brain says, ah, LH and FSH, let me stimulate the testes and the ovary to make the appropriate, they make so, an egg, make estrogen, they make, make, they make testosterone from the, from the Leydig cells. Something I, that makes sense. Something I forgot to mention. I don't think you'll mind me sharing because I'm not saying their name, but um, undescended testicle as well. Do you think that's why? Okay, so <clears throat> okay, so here's gets back to the magic of glycosylation. Okay, so now glycosylation is the normal binding of a sugar. Remember, there are many sugars, not just glucose, to a protein. So endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi apparatus, that's where protein production and glycosylation take place. So these, these, these proteins are getting the proper three-dimensional structure and the proper charge, negative or positive, so that when they are released in the bloodstream, these are hormones, okay? LH and FSH, by the way, are glycoproteins. AMH is a glycoprotein. So the glycosylation is critical, which then goes to the organ system and turn things on or off. Mm -hmm. So if your glycation is damaged, if your glycosylation is damaged by glycation, and what's the leading cause of glycation? Sugar. Sugar. Which one? Glucose. Yeah. It's the leading glycator. And how do we know that? Because diabetes is an excessive sugar environment in the bloodstream. Okay, so diabetics get glycation to every nook and cranny of their body. They lose their legs, their eyes, their kidneys, their heart, their life, just to name a few things. And so if you think about it, um, so there are signals in the body that happen due to some glycosylating process. Why and when, that's a little bit of a mystery, but there's probably things that have to do with the circadian rhythm, the light. Uh, of 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 the of the world and 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 so there are things that cause the testes to drop at the right time, cause the uterus to form properly. Every organ system in your body. If you think about every abnormality, even a chromosomal, a genetic, or an anatomic abnormality, it's likely caused by defective glycosylation or glycosylation product or a foreign glycan that actually has been derived to do exactly what it does to either disrupt your normal function and or kill you. Hmm. Because a bacteria yeast and virus wants to eat you. Would you agree? Yeah. Do they want to eat plants? Yes, they yeah. do. So do plants... Are they live organisms? Mm -hmm. Do they have a life cycle that they want to find food? Mm -hmm. Are plants capable of killing things? Yes. Are they able to sense the environment? Mm -hmm. Energy. It's all basic energy. It's electromolecular energy. See, we put it into sort of this idea that of of a of a of a product that has a shape, a size, or it has something that's really good for us, like like um, 
um, glucose, right? Or some protein is really good for us, by the way. And we overemphasize the value of proteins. They're less valuable than you think because we need a lot less than we say, in my opinion. Okay, because you will rarely find protein deficiency, but you will find overexposure to sugar and underexposure to fat. Anorexics die fast. And so fat is the fuel for the mitochondria, not sugar. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll just throw this in real quick, is the function of the liver is to make fat via insulin out of amino acids and sugars. And if you cannot do that, you die fast. And so this idea that glucose is your mitochondrial energy and it's the energy for your brain, I will bet is incorrect. Mm -hmm. Same. And it's, it's, if you step back, you might be able to understand it, but it, since it's so propaganda in us that sugars are fast energy and fat is our long energy, that's the confusing part. So for this LH, um, LH FSH, chronically high, undescended testicle, what, what, like, what's the solution? Is it bad to have that? Is it, does it make the person well, well, What are the so, solutions here? An undescended testes. Sorry, I went on a diet. <laughs> no, no, I right? love that you did that. Oh, <laughs> um, so, an undescended testes is at risk of developing cancer because it's exposed to the wrong temperature for too long. And so, you got to pull it down if you can get it down. Okay? And so, my bet is the high LH and FSH is related to low or no testosterone produced in the testes. Got it. That makes sense. And, and, and it's, some people go through, so, but there may be things that bind to the testes and produce and, and, and block the normal LH and FSH exposure to that, to that, 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 um, protein, uh, a key lock, um, and, and so that's part of the problem. We don't always know the why part of it or what it is, but my bet is in, a, in sort of a global concept and idea, something happened that prevented the normal drop down of the testes. Then it was exposed to the wrong temperature. And because of that, it began to die off. And now it can't make testosterone anymore. The brain says make testosterone, it, it may make a little bit because the higher the, the LH and FSH goes, it's trying to make the testosterone. Eventually, it, it, it dies and it's just like way up here and not just up here when it should be down here. Got it. Okay. So finding a way to pull it back down would be ideal. What happens if the person can't do that? What, they just well, well, so historically you'd find these at a young age because typically there's a there's a scrotal testicular inguinal exam for children, uh, number one. And also in the, the newborn exam, we'll always look to fill the testes. Right. Now, they, if they're not there right away, they may drop subsequently, but typically you'll get that in the first or second year of life or by age five, someone's going to find that. And if they can, they're usually stuck in the inguinal canal and they can be brought down, but sometimes they can't and they're removed. It's usually one, not both. And so that's why, um, you know, you could still function with one testicle uh, in this. But if it's an adult and it's found, it may be removed. Uh, if it's just one and the other one's okay. Um, but if the LHFSH is high, but I've seen people where you have a high LH and FSH, but you still find sperm. Yeah. So the question is, you know, they, so if they're not having fertility problems and they've got one high testes and they're getting higher LH and FSHs, they may be on their way to something that's going to damage the testy the rest of the way. Um, and they're at higher risk of potentially testicular cancer also because of where it's at. So what, what are some markers they should get to, to, to monitor? Or do they just get a physical every year? Well, they should certainly see a physician that has expertise in that area. An ultrasound can help, um, and and uh, look at the testosterone, LH, and FSH levels. Um, and certainly, you know, this is where metabolic um, uh, evaluation, cardiovascular evaluation, and just general health and wellness evaluation, because you might find that you have some other things going around um, at the same time, 
uh, that may be contributing to to sir your overall health and wellness. Yeah, it makes sense. Awesome, great answer. So, last question is this: Vitamin G, my favorite vitamin in the world. Gratitude. <laughs> my question for you, Doc, is: What are you grateful for today? I'm grateful for being here with you today and sharing these ideas of health and wellness that really each and every human being can take control of their health and wellness. And you can be, you can be, you can serve your physician actually to share this information so they can learn it and share it with others. So every day I go through the gratitude list and I, I, I did ask you the question and you gave me that answer, and I now use it in all of my questions, by the it. way, when I talk to people, because, you know, we learn something from everyone, and gratitude, attitude. Uh, I'm listening to David Goggin's book, um, um, you know, uh, Never Finished, and uh, and reading Sean Baker's book, and, and reading and watching your stuff is, is amazing, but grateful for all the exposure to these ideas that are opposite and hard to believe. And, and when you expose yourself to things you don't believe and are opposite, you grow and learn. Mm. And, and that's, that's really the, the key to this. And we're all, we're all healing. And love and gratitude is, is the key. And I think the one thing we're missing in this space is faith in God and the higher power within all of us. Mm. And when we can share that, because this isn't, there's no fight here. You and I disagree on things. I disagree with a lot of people on things, but, but I'm always, well, you know, well, and I just am curious, well, well, what are the, maybe there is a solution or an example to explain it. And we just haven't gotten there yet because we know like almost nothing in this universe. Yeah. I, I love that. Nothing. I love that. Added, your attitude. I love your mindset. I was telling you earlier, you're just somebody who's open, you're non-dogmatic. So I appreciate that about you. And of course, you're a brilliant uh, physician who has so much knowledge, but you're so open to conversations and you're always learning and unlearning and relearning. And I respect that a lot. Can I say one other thing? Yeah, please. Or two other things. So, so you, you know, you, you said um, we are all amazingly smart and our DNA is masterful. And the more I sort of in, in, it just immerse myself in these conversations, I become smarter. Yeah. And, and that's what it really is about. You know, everyone is smart. And, you know, this keto and carnivore healing people with autism and all so many learning disabilities and this idea is that, that we all learn differently. I learned by doing. I couldn't read. And so the exposing ourselves to things. And then one other thing, heat damages DNA. And excessive exercise can heat up the core and cause damage, which may also lead to a lot of diseases. I just wanted to mention that because the same thing with the testicle. So we learn from, gee, why is the testicle outside? Because it must be cooler. And, and excessive exercise may be damaging and deadly to some people and less so others. And why? Because the leading way to, the, the, to denature DNA is just heat it up. Mm. Just throw an egg in a pan and see what happens. You think that's in, So you think that's what happened with your friend who, who was over the... I, I think that that was a big factor yeah. that contributed to that. But again, we're speculating. Mm -hmm. yep. You know, that's the fun part of this. And listen, you love running so much because it helps in other areas. Go for it. You know, I slowed down personally, but I loved it. And and I didn't exercise for 10 years. And literally about a year ago, I got back into it because I was missing something. Yeah. And and I and I enjoyed it. Plus, I want to look like Sean Baker and Anthony Chafee someday. <laughs> yeah, it's a good goal. Well, there's so much that uh, we'll cover on round two, like fasting and some different topics. So we'll do a round two. But your website is drkilts.com. That is doctor spelled out. And your Instagram is at Dr. Kilt. Again, Dr. Spelled Out. Anywhere else you want them to go and check you out? That's the best place. Just go there. Then you can get to every other place in the universe. And, you know, that's a beauty. And I link people like yourself and all other people in this space that have inspired me to dig in and learn more. And we have to be lifetime learners. That's the most important thing. Continue being a student. Amen. I love that. Well, thanks for coming on Amen. the show. I've got vitamin G for you, doc. I already look forward to the next time we do this again. I love you, my friend. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. it. Thank you.